This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution, you can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. And so I want to give a special thank you to Antonia Kruger, who just signed up this week to support us on Patreon, and to Taylor Peter, who just made a very generous contribution to the show via PayPal. All right, so now let's get to our show. Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 404 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Today on the show, we'll be reviewing the new movie, The Invisible Man, directed by Lee Wan l and discussing the theme of invisibility in science fiction. And this will include spoilers for The Invisible Man, and may include spoilers for other books and movies that we discuss, so just be aware of that. And I'm joined by three guests. So first up, we've got Anthony Ha, making his 18th appearance on the show. He covers media, advertising, and pop culture for the new site TechCrunch, where he also hosts the podcast Original Content. A chapbook of his short stories called Love Songs for Monsters was published by Youth in Decline in 2014, and a short story Late Train appeared in the February 2019 issue of Lady Churchill's Rosebud Wristlet. So, Anthony, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me back. The next up, we've got Lisa Yazik, making her fourth appearance on the show. She's a professor of science fiction studies at Georgia Tech, and author of the nonfiction books Galactic Suburbia, Sisters of Tomorrow, and The Future is Female. She also recently appeared in the AMC miniseries, James Cameron's Story of Science Fiction. So, Lisa, welcome to the show. It's great to be here, Dave. And also joining us today is John Kessel, making his fifth appearance on the show. He's the author of such novels as The Moon and the Other and Pride and Prometheus, and such short story collections as The Pure Product and The Bomb Plan for Financial Independence. He helped organize the Creative Writing MFA program at North Carolina State University and also served as its first director. So, John, welcome to the show. I'm glad to be here. Thanks. All right, so let's start off with Lisa and have just tell us about what sort of expectations did you have going into this new Invisible Man movie? So I have to admit, I went in with fairly low expectations. Um, I'm I'm not a huge fan of remakes because I feel like there's so many great movies out there I want to see and stories out there. I want to see new movies of them. And then when I had heard that, oh, the twist is that it's not just about the Invisible Man, but it's about uh, the Invisible Man using his invisibility to stalk his ex-girlfriend, I was like, wow, I really don't know that I need to see this. I mean, I, I live in a culture where there's all, all kinds of violence against women being reported all the time, and I'm not sure I want to spend $20 for the privilege of seeing it as entertainment. But I have to admit, I went into the movie and I really enjoyed it. It was a, a, a real fun, stylish film, and I actually thought it did a, a pretty smart job of updating a lot of Wells's themes for the modern moment. So is that pretty much all you knew about it going in, or did you know anything about the director or the how the movie came about or anything like that? I did not know much about it at all. I knew that the director uh, was part of the writing team from Saw, which was another reason I, I both didn't didn't <laughs> want to see it. Like, you know, I thought the movies were stylish, but I, I, I'm, I'm good. I, I was good after those. And then, of course, you know, I knew Elizabeth Moss coming to this from The Handmaid's Tale and, and from uh, some other roles that she's played, um, like in uh, Mad Men. And so I thought, well, she'll be probably pretty cool. But that was really all I knew about it. Um, and then, like I said, it was two hours of pleasant surprises for me. And as from what I could tell the rest of the audience, mm -hmm. everyone was yelling and cheering and with our heroine to the end. Yeah. So like you, I, I didn't actually know that much about this movie going into it. I mean, you know, when I heard that there was a new Invisible Man movie, it wasn't something where I felt like I had to run out and see it. But then I saw the trailer for it and the trailer for it just looked really, really good. And so, uh, so I was like, oh, I'm probably going to see that. And then it got really good reviews. Um, and that's what made me go see it. But I, I didn't even really know who directed it or anything um, when I went and saw it. Um, and so how about John? Did you, well, what sort of expectations did you have going into this movie? Yeah, my my uh, experience was similar to yours. I, did, I saw a preview of it at, when I was seeing another film and it, it looked interesting. And, and uh, you know, I had not seen any of uh, the director's other films. I sort of avoid horror movies. So that was a little bit... Uh, if it was going to be a horror film with uh, uh, lots of violence, I, I wasn't crazy to see it. But, um, you know, I'm intrigued by the principle. I'm a, a huge fan of uh, Wells and his original book. And it's it seemed to me, just from the little the trailer, that it might be a more intelligent take on invisibility than you normally see in, in movies. 
So that that drew, drew me into the theater, and I did enjoy it. I have a couple of quibbles about it. Maybe we'll get to talk about it, but but I thought it was a a, a good movie. Yeah. Well, so how about Anthony? Uh, what were your expectations going into this? I was pretty optimistic. In fact, I sort of forced some of my friends to go with me on opening night. And um, I think that was a combination of factors. One is I think I'm just very, both as a, like a horror fan and somebody who's interested in the movie business, I'm uh, really interested in Blumhouse Productions, which has made um, Get Out and Split and, and I think has sort of kind of carved out this niche for itself of doing low budget horror movies where you know, as I understand it, the the director usually has a great deal of autonomy. There's basically this trade off of like, we'll give you five or ten million dollars, and you'll be able to make the movie that you want to make as long as you don't spend more than whatever the budget is. And and so that I think so in general, when Blumhouse is making a film, I'm I'm usually interested in it. And then on top of that, I had a chance to interview Lee Winnell for his last film, Upgrade, and he struck me as a you know really thoughtful, smart, and nice guy. Um, and so I, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that Upgrade was a film that I, I loved, but I thought it was interesting and also used its limited budget in a, in a pretty resourceful way. And then I think on top of that, just the idea of this film, it seemed very risky in the sense of telling a sort of feminist version of the invisible man that's focused on gaslighting but if you have a white guy as the writer director i was a little bit nervous about it but the fact that elizabeth moss was involved and it just seemed like a really fresh idea so i i came into it with with fairly high expectations yeah well so let's uh, uh so the premise yeah is that there's um the elizabeth moss character cecilia and she, uh, in the opening scene, we see her escaping from the house that she is her her boyfriend's house, who's this very wealthy uh, Silicon Valley guy who's a like a brilliant inventor. And um, and so we we instantly gather that she's absolutely terrified of him, and she's sneaking out and taking all these elaborate precautions to make sure that he doesn't uh, know that she's trying to sneak out. And then she um, escapes from the house and runs through the woods, and her sister picks her up in a car and as they're starting to pull away the boyfriend comes charging out of the woods and punches his hand through the window of the car and is shouting at her that she can't ever leave and they drive off and that's kind of how it starts and, and it's so very very at least for me very intense very you know instantly grabbed i was just like heart racing like wow this is this is really like grabbing my attention here um so let's start off with that first scene and which is our introduction to this story and so anthony just said it was uh this is sort of a feminist um take so uh so lisa let's get your thoughts on that just um starting off with that first scene say did this um, yeah. seem like it was going to be a feminist take on the invisible man to you it it did and i mean I, of course i went in knowing that 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 was some of the backstory to it i do have to admit i i, I knew about that shift in the perspective um and i thought again it was just so stylishly done and 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 the way I always tell my students, like when you're reading, you know, you're reading a great science fiction story. If it grabs you in the first paragraph or, or even better in that first sentence. And I felt like those opening beats just grabbed you so well. I mean, you know, you're, you've described the whole scene, but it starts with her trying to get out of the bed. And even though she's like, she's drugged the guy. First of all, she can't get him to let go. He's got her, his arm around her so tight and it takes her like a minute to sort of get out from underneath him. So you, I thought that was just a really smart way right away of conveying sort of the way he was holding her so tight and, and the desperateness with which she needed to get away. And I loved that we didn't have to see an actual scene of physical violence, that it was enough for us to sort of see that aftermath and, and her fear and the way she'd been reshaped. I thought that was so much smarter than anything they could have shown us, right? I mean, what you fill in with your mind is always scarier than anything any director is going to show me. Yeah. So, 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 uh, so John, what'd you think of that? That opening Well, scene? I, I, I thought it was very gripping too. And it, it, you know, in the context of a, being a movie about invisibility, someone who can become invisible and, and has that power, uh, that opening scene really, uh, sort of sets it up because, uh, it, basically, what it conveys is that she's a person who has had no moment at which she has not been surveilled. Okay. She is always being watched. She is, she's being seen and, and uh, even her mind is being uh, seen by him and, and controlled. And so, and there are cameras all over his house, uh, that she has to get around. And, and so, uh, 
you know, in a way, uh, we know that he's going to appear later as uh, I- invisible, and and uh, and so that sort of sets that up that. That uh, not only uh, will she be uh, under at risk in his home, but and when she's with him, but anywhere uh, that that he would have the power to uh, use invisibility to uh, to to know everything about her and what she's doing, which is really very creepy. Yeah, I also thought it was a really striking choice that you never really get a good look at him. You know, I mean, right. she's, yeah. she's in bed yes. with him, but you don't really get a good look at his face ever in this scene. Or really, you don't get yeah. a good look at his face until the end, the end of the movie, basically. And so he is this, like, he's almost an invisible man even before he becomes the invisible man. Um, and is this sort of like, yeah, is, is, is more frightening, I think, because he's he's mysterious in a way. And, um, you know, they don't have any dialogue together or anything. So So he is almost this, like, primal force of terror or something uh yeah you know, the movie establishes that right away um anthony any thoughts about that opening scene or shall we move on to the later stuff uh, i think we can move on i mean i agree that it, it's incredibly effective and like just all the little details about the scene where like you can see the like that she had not only did she escaping but she had to she felt like she had to drug him in order to be able to get away and all these steps she's taken. I mean, I think, I think that scene is, is pretty close to perfect, even though it also, and I think this comes back in later in the film is, um, this sort of classic horror movie thing where, you know, it's, it's, it's so effective and the way you can tell it's so effective is that you just want to be like shouting at her, like, no, move faster, go faster, get out of there. Yeah. And, and there was a it took a great deal of restraint not to be shouting at the screen from the opening scene. Well, yeah, I, I guess, I mean, I don't know, this is sort of, I don't know if I want to get into it, but I, I had an issue with her stopping to help the dog. Um, Man, I wanted to yell, leave the dog, <laughs> forget the dog. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know, maybe I'll come back to the dog, because I have a whole, like, thing about the dog. But, um, so 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 that's the opening scene, and then we jump to two weeks later, and she's staying with a friend of hers, or a friend of her sister's, uh, named James, who's a police officer, and his teenage daughter, and she's staying there because... Um, her boyfriend, Adrian, his name is Adrian Griffin. Uh, Griffin is the name of the character from the original um, Invisible Man, H.G. Wells novel. But so she's staying there because he doesn't hopefully know that she'll be, you know, she, he doesn't know of this address. And so then her, her sister comes by and says that Adrian is dead. Um, and they go and meet Adrian's brother, Tom, who tells her that Adrian has left her a lot of money. And... Um, so she's able to use the money to kind of help out her friends, but then starts uh, feeling like she's being haunted, uh, like Adrian's invisible presence is, is somehow around. Um, and pretty much like this whole, this is sort of the whole first act of the movie. Like everything in this just worked for me pretty much perfectly. I don't have any any complaints about this really at all. Um, so I guess I'll just throw that out there. Does anyone have any criticisms of this uh section of the movie where she's living at James's house and sort of starts to get this idea that weird stuff's going on. Um, you know, I, yeah. I, I always thought it was interesting that uh, if you didn't know it was a movie about an invisible man, uh, then you could think it's a story where maybe she's, you know, undergoing some kind of psychological breakdown and, and fantasizing. Uh, but, but of course we know that no, she isn't. She's, she's, um, uh, but, but in other words, for the first third of the movie, the things that she tells about could really be, uh, um, you know, her delusions, but, but of course they're not. Yeah. And I think given that she's certainly built up to be pretty scarred by that relationship, right? Like the way she's so terrified to go outside, um, would, would give credence to that if you're, if you're somehow already not convinced there's an invisible man. I actually love those scenes where she couldn't go to the mailbox. I thought that was really, um, scary and moving and um, felt right for that. And I thought, again, sort of mm-hmm. built up the terror of whatever had happened between her and Adrian. Um, what I thought was kind of stupid, though, I did have a problem with this part of the movie, and I could not believe she took the money. Like, why would you mm. do anything to connect yourself to your abuser after you'd gone so far away to escape him? I mean, even in death, like, that connects you to his family and his estate and and all those invisible networks that he manipulates. Right. Um, and so I realized maybe for the purposes of the movie, but I don't know. I was just like, Oh, sister. No. <laughs> so you, know? you, you wanted to say, take your $5 million. I don't I want it. Did, I did, you know, but I understand for the purposes of the plot and I, you know, I guess I could even see where someone psychologically would say, think they deserve that money, but I don't, I don't know. It felt 
a little off, but you know, we had to get the plot going, so I went with it. Yeah, I guess. This well, is- I guess. Pr- I was going to say that particularly since you don't – there are things where they talk about, you know, that she's able to set up this bank account for her friend's daughter to go to Parsons. Yeah. But in general, you don't get a strong sense that she's in, you know, uh, a really serious financial need. So it's not like she's like, oh, I desperately need money and this – Right. Mu- this, you know, windfall is coming to me at the time I need. It's more just like, oh, wouldn't it be nice to have $5 million, which I can certainly understand, but – so with, you know, especially knowing the conceit of the movie, but even not knowing that, it, it seems like a bad idea on some level. But also, I, I don't know if I would turn down $5 million. Yeah, I will I not would in turn that down. situation. If anyone wants I, to really? give me $5 million, I will take it. Really? Even if that meant like sort of having to rethink those years of abuse and trauma? That seems... Oh, you guys are stronger men than I am. That's all I can say. <laughs> well, well, so, so Lisa, you're I saying... think it's a more abstract challenge probably to us as men. <laughs> I think that that yeah. might be the case. Yeah. But, but so Lisa, yeah. so you're, you're saying that it was necessary for the plot though. So could you elaborate on that? Like how does this well, serve the plot? Right. I mean, because that keeps her close to the family. Right. Um, and that sort of uh, provides the excuse for the brother to be in her life off and on. And also, obviously, this man, right, Adrian Griffin, he's a master of the invisible, not just turning himself invisible, but of invisible networks, right, of surveillance systems and um, other kinds of communication systems. He hacks into her computer and starts sending mail in her name, right? I mean, and it seems like the minute you say, okay, let me join my bank account to yours, right, that's just one more avenue for that man to be in. Right. I, I guess that's true. It's necessary to establish him as this manipulative person through these conversations right. she has with his right. brother. And the brother says, he just like dominated me my whole life. And don't let him now that he's dead, just like don't let him continue to mess with your head, even in death and all this stuff. Yeah, I think that I agree yeah. that. Yeah, that is kind of necessary for the plot. But she but as far as she knows, and, you know, it's been reported in the news that he is dead. He committed suicide. They have photographs of him, you know. Uh, so, uh, uh in other words, I, I you know, I, I think actually it is a, a very good point to, to make that oh, oh, uh, women might be a lot more skeptical about this than, than a man would be in the situation. But they do make attempts, I think, to to uh, account for why she would agree to do this. Yeah. And- yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yeah, so so we have this sort of early section in the movie where there's just weird stuff going on, and she has this, you know, this feeling that weird stuff's going on, and her suspicion is growing. Um, but the you know, this sort of builds to a an episode where she's up in the attic, and she just knows she's about to come down out of the attic. She's found all sorts of weird stuff stuff up in the attic, and she just has this feeling that he's there in front of her, and he uh, and she grabs a can of paint and sort of throws it down the stairs, and it splashes all over his head and shoulders, and you see him there, and it's this great jump scare and that leads into this really really intense sort of physical altercation in the kitchen um which was really i think unlike any other you know like every other invisible man kind of movie that i've seen where somebody's fighting an invisible foe it's always super like you can just tell they're just there's nobody there you know it doesn't look uh convincing at all and this one was really really uh tactile and uh just uh physical uh, in a way I found really just shockingly effective. Um, so what did everyone think when the movie starts becoming more of a sort of overtly violent? It, go, it goes from being this sort of haunt, psychological haunting to overt physical combat. Um, how about Lisa? What did you, you think of that? Um, oh, it was exciting. I mean, by that point, I was I was all in for the movie. And um, it was I liked I liked the moment when she dumped the paint and uh, I thought that looked cool. And then I'm, I still don't know quite how she got down past him out of the attic and back onto the ground floor. But the the overall fight was, I thought, really um, great, especially like the, the movie had become so gothic. Right. And in gothic movies, there's always women in peril trapped in some man's house. Um, and, and I like that no matter where she goes in this movie, she's in some man's house and in peril. It was kind of interesting. And eventually she has to figure out what to do about that. Um, so I thought that was cool and of course, entirely appropriate that they fight through the kitchen and she's fighting with pots and pans against him. Just putting that out there. Mm-hmm. I thought those, uh, those, uh, fight scenes and the lighter one with the police and the, uh, the, uh, medical unit, uh, were very well done. The special effects were really remarkable, I thought, in this, this film. Um, you know, I, I, uh, and it's very brutal. I, I, it's, it's, it's hard to watch. Uh, 
I I really did have some trouble with the paint thing because you know apparently he goes down and runs tap water over the his suit and and somehow all of the paint <laughs> goes away, all right, and that really bothered me. Okay, it put threw me out of the scene because I thought no, there's no way that that uh you know if you pour a bunch of latex paint on somebody that within you know three minutes it's gone and so that that really uh made it hard for me to. To, to believe but this is the kind of thing you see in, in science fiction movies all the time you just have to take that you know maybe the invisibility suit has like stain guard technology <laughs> well i actually i had thought that too i thought for sure it would like partially short out and we would like see him flicker in and out after that or something but but no i guess paint doesn't short out that suit it's amazing it, it's it did seem in general like you, you had to that the, a friend one of the people i saw it with mentioned that the suit, it almost seemed like the suit not only made him invisible, but like gave him these other superpowers in particular strength because, yeah. you know, he could like basically work his way through an entire room of armed, you know, security guards and, and beat all of them up. And, and I think, yeah, to a certain extent, you just have to accept some of that or, or not. Um, but, but that, that, that once he's invisible, he is this kind of all omniscient, incredibly, savvy monster and and you and you kind of go with it yeah well i mean i think that i mean there's just some stuff you just have to grant that like he never coughs or sneezes or like bumps into stuff and you know like like you know that he, he you know or has to use the bathroom people the bathroom. never people never hear him you know yeah. uh yeah. It, it's interesting that they don't use that uh the idea that someone might hear him doing something which is interesting because I was looking at the original um invisible man and they hear him all the time because he has a cold for most of the book because he's right, naked, because right. that's the only way he can be invisible, right. and he gets sick. And I just thought that was interesting. But yeah, and here, this man's you know, silent. I, I liked it that they used this uh, this tech uh, to make him invisible, which uh, bends the light around his, you know, the suit that he's wearing. Uh, actually, I have exactly that technology suits in my novel, The Moon and the Other, uh, to make people invisible. So you can read that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they probably stole it from you yeah i don't think so i think someone else did it long before me but um you know i i i really uh uh felt that that was cool that he was a tech uh uh you know uh, ceo and and a supposed genius for this i i thought the movie could have done a little more with backstory so for instance if he had a gym in his house where he worked out all the time in martial arts or something you know even if you just sort of did that in in you know 15 seconds uh early in the movie then then that would help explain how he's able to take out all these cops especially since he's invisible but you know maybe that's not necessary. but i did feel that in general that the characters the characters were fine they were fine enough to carry you along you knew enough about them to carry you along in the story but you didn't really have a good sense of who they were outside of the events of this particular story which i I, I would have liked. I mean, it, it, it's interesting how the movie does take this invisibility idea and then use it to make a kind of social comment about male, uh, you know, attempts to control women and and the power that uh, that men want to have over uh, not just women but everyone. Uh, um, but then I, I thought it didn't go as far with that as it might have. Yeah, I mean, I thought the movie was pretty excellent uh, overall. I would definitely recommend it. But there is like like you're saying, John. There are just these sort of fudges that they have to do to make the plot kind of work out. I guess Lisa was mentioning this too, and and those fudges kind of the the cumulative weight of them sort of build up over the course of the movie, so that by the end, especially once we get started getting into some of the more the bigger twists toward the end, my my suspension of disbelief was was really being strained. Um, but there was nothing really in the movie that I I hated. It was just sort of like it was there's there just a lot of things where I was kind of like. Eh. And then there were enough of them by the end that, you know, my, my suspension of disbelief was, was, was flagging. But um, I don't know that I have a whole lot of thoughts about anything they should have done dramatically differently. I mean, like my, my main criticism through the, this middle section of the movie is that it, so um, uh, Adrian, the Invisible Man, he makes various efforts to alienate um, Cecilia's friends and family from her. And so I thought that her friends and family, particularly her sister, abandoned her with shocking alacrity you know i mean like um when um her sister gets this this mean email and uh is not even willing to have a conversation about whether cecilia really sent it that that, that sort of struck a wrong note for me but it, in a feature film there's only so much time you can spend developing these things but right. that was something that definitely like i, I was kind of like i'm just gonna go with this 
Um, right. I mean, I guess to me, it felt like there there was a degree of I, I get a, I was a little relieved of it felt like we were accelerating through the friends not believing her portion. And and so I rather than having three different conversations where her sister is increasingly alienated, I, I sort of accepted it as a plot device. I will say that from a believability standpoint, it also worked in the sense that um, at that point, the uh, Cecilia was a little bit you know, seemed very sort of emotionally and mentally distraught. And so I could understand why you might, you weren't necessarily, not, she was, her sister wasn't necessarily saying, I don't ever want to see you again, but more, I'm just in a place where you, and you're in a place where we shouldn't be talking right now. And maybe in a few days when you've cooled down, we can, we can figure this out. But like, you have really hurt me and I don't have, and, and you seem kind of crazy right now. And so I don't have the energy to, to deal with that. I would say though that the far more effective scene was, and and possibly the the kind of the scariest and most shocking scene in the movie for me was the one with the daughter of of her friend, where they're you know, she's Cecilia is starting to pull herself together, and and Sydney the daughter is is comforting her and saying let's have a girls' night, and then uh, Adrian in his oh, invisible yeah. state hits her, yeah, and and it just totally it's, changes it's, the dynamic. It's the daughter. Yeah. Hits the daughter, and the daughter understandably is convinced that Cecilia was the one who hit her. And then her her friend um, James, of course, then is like, "Oh my God! Like you're you, this? How could you do this?" And there's this 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 sense of like suspicion and betrayal. And to me, that was completely believable. That listen, this is the one line that I'm your friend, but I I cannot accept that you've done this. And th- to me, that just to feel that sense of kind of everything crumbling around her. I thought that worked really well. Yeah, I thought that was a really good plot move because uh, it's simple. It's not complicated. It doesn't involve any really crazy trickery. But, it, you know, you can see how it would completely poison the, uh, the situation there. Yeah, and to me that felt more plausible than the sort of compressed way in which her sister abandoned her. Because, mm-hmm. right, your kid is threatened and you're like, okay, well, I, I don't know what's going on with you, but I've got to get take care of my child now so that – that works. Yeah. yeah. I did wonder with the sister if there I, I'm not sure how I feel about this. I'm just throwing this out there. But if there could have been more of an implication that their relationship, Cecilia and her sister was on the rocks before this, you know, and this was kind of the last straw, but they had had yeah. sort of a tempestuous. I think that that, uh, you know, that's a kind of backstory thing they could have layered in there earlier in the film. You know, when she drives up to pick her up after she's escaped from the uh, Adrian's house, uh, she's a little late. And I'm, you know, I'm wondering if. You know, it could have been that she's skeptical about about uh, Cecilia's uh, baloney all the time. You know, her her uh, psychodrama with Adrian, and so she really is skeptical about that. And and you know, in other words, but you know, this is sort of quibbling, really, to to ask for this kind of stuff. I, I as I watched yeah. the movie, I I was not I w- I was pulled right along. It really is a very effective plot uh, 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 with a twists and turns, and and it evolves from one thing to the next, escalating very well. Uh, so in in retrospect, I think you can see where they might have done some of these things, but I, I probably 90% of the audience isn't going to care about that. <laughs> oh, yeah, I agree. And I was pulled along, too. I mean, and it was a two-hour movie, and I don't think I wasn't bored for a minute. So I mean, that's really to its credit. Yeah, but I mean, I found that I loved it as it was going on. As I said, I started to like sort of not believe stuff so mm-hmm. much toward the end. Right. But then it was one of those movies where the more you think about it, you're like, wait. I have more and more problems with this the more I think right. about it. And I feel that way about the invisible man in general. Though, so. <laughs> um but but um so yeah, and but I feel like this movie it, it like it succeeds on execution. I, I mean, if um you know, you had an actress who was, you know, half as good as Elizabeth Moss and a director who was half as good as um uh, Lee w- uh Winnell that I could see this movie just being a totally corny B movie monster movie thing with the same storyline. You know, it's, it's really just the incredible acting and the incredible execution directing to my mind that sort of raises this so much, um, you know, above what the, the basic plot by itself would necessarily, um, you know, make you, make you expect. Right. I read an interesting uh, interview with the director where he also said, you know, everyone, all props to Bloomhouse themselves. Um, you know, because uh, 
everyone there really gave him the power to do what he wanted. Um, I think as Andrew had mentioned before that they have a lot of directorial freedom um, there. And that in fact, apparently there had been early notes where audiences had said, well, we need to have more like where you established that he's violent towards her and things like that. And they said, no, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. Keep it metaphorical. Keep it just the reactions. Keep it scary. And I think that that's really, you know, to its credit and part of why it's such an effective movie. Yeah, I agree with that. I, did, I, th I, I found him terrifying. I was sufficiently yeah. persuaded of his terrifyingness from the opening scene. I didn't need any more. I guess, I mean, the things that, as I said, like really sort of threw me toward the end was where, so 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 basically, I mean, there's all sorts of stuff that happens, but it sort of climaxes with um, the Invisible Man coming back to James's house and attacking um, the, the daughter, Sydney, and um, uh, Cecilia and James managed to subdue him and, and uh, kill him. And then when Cecilia takes his mask off, it's the brother, um, you know, rather than, than Adrian. And then um, there's this whole thing where um, we're or at least the authorities are led to believe that that the brother was behind everything and that he had imprisoned Adrian and masterminded the whole thing. And then um, uh, then Cecilia goes and kind of has sits down and has dinner with Adrian and um and he's sort of trying to convince her that, no, I was the victim here all along. And um, all this stuff I thought was pretty effective from a plot point of view in terms of plot twists and things. But I, I, this is where I was really having major suspension of disbelief issues that, that any of this would be playing out this way. Um, so, uh, so, Anthony, what do you think about that? Did you, how'd you feel about that? Um, I, fundamentally, I don't think any of that stuff bothered me. Um, I will say that the... The way that there, there's so there's a scene that involves her going back to the house and finding the suit, and then he arrives, and um, and then she like stuffs the suit into this tunnel, and then she runs away, and and I and I and I felt like that scene felt sort of specific. In retrospect, you could see that he kind of uh, manufactured everything so that the suit would be waiting for her in that in that um, final dinner. And and so I, I I could sort of acknowledge that, and I think also I was very wait, wait, curious wait, about wait, the wait 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 wait. So you think that Adrian planned for her to hide the suit? Oh, sorry, sorry. The, the I mean, director. he being the director, the oh, director. Oh, okay. I could see the the director slash writer's hand there, being like, what I being I was confused about why the scene at the house in the middle of the film played out the way it did until she went back for the suit later. Right. Then you realize, oh, this. It had to play out that way because the suit had to be there waiting for her for her to kill him, but I you know so I can see that that you know the a little bit too much of like the machinations of the director and similarly actually, actually, I was sorry, a, let me let me jump in there right because I have a theory about that scene and this this mm -hmm. ties into my grand like dog my grand unicorn <laughs> all right. dog theory right. all right because like in the movie as it exists right now there's absolutely no reason for the dog to be in the movie at all and it raises like so many questions like wait why is the dog still at the house and stuff like that. But so I think what was supposed to happen in that scene was that she only escapes from the closet because the dog who likes her and doesn't like Adrian attacks Adrian. And then she's able to escape because of that. But then on the day of filming, they couldn't get the dog to really do it. Like I heard a, like something like that happened with Game of Thrones where they, the dire wolf was supposed to rip somebody's hand off and the dog was so well behaved. They couldn't really get it to do it. So they kind of had to like <laughs> cut it together weird. But the dog just kind of barks once at Adrian. But I feel like like that's the whole reason, like that's what was supposed to happen. And that's why the dog is in the story at all. And that's why she's nice to the dog at the beginning. And it's established that Adrian's mean to the dog at the beginning because it would all set that up. So I don't know. I don't have any inside info. That's just that's just my theory for what the dog was doing in this movie at all. Well, that makes sense. I think that's, yeah, it's plausible. Because yeah, I mean, the dog it doesn't really pay off in any big way. I wonder if there weren't more scenes with Adrian and the dog, because I noticed that when we see the dog the last time in the house, it's limping and it wasn't limping in the earlier scenes. So I'm wondering if, because didn't she let the dog go when she took off? I mm -hmm. thought she, she, she told she, the dog to go. She took off his so like electric shock collar. Right. I'm, so I'm wondering if we're supposed to have the implication, did Adrian hunt the dog down and hurt it and bring it back just like he's going to do to her? That's kind of what I was assuming maybe, but I feel like maybe a scene hit the floor somewhere that we didn't see. Interesting. Like there might have been more with the dogs, you know, that's the only way I can figure it out. Yeah. But, but so I'm sorry, Anthony, I kind of cut you off there. Did you have other stuff you were going to oh, yeah. say? I, I did want to mention, I think the other thing that that is a plausibility issue is I was very curious about the conversation between Adrian and his brother, where if we assume that it, every other scene where we, where there's an invisible man, it's Adrian. 
um, and this one time his brother went, then it sort of begs the question of like, what was, why did Adrian say, okay, you know what? This time you should do it. This time when we're, <laughs> there's actually going to be some murders, you should go ahead, go ahead, have a good time. If I were his brother, which, to be fair, I think we've accepted, we, we've established at this point that, that it's a, a situation where Adrian is really dominant in this relationship and can kind of push his brother to do whatever he wants. But I would certainly be very suspicious about why this one time I was being asked to put on the invisibility suit. Uh, but all of that said, I mean, I think for me, the, these seemed, I, again, I think a lot of it ties into just sort of accepting that Adrian is this super strong, super genius, as well as being able to manufacture an invisibility suit on his own. Um, and, and that I, I, part of it, I think because all of it led to the, to me, what was such an amazing scene. And even though you knew something was going to happen with the invisibility suit, the suddenness of the ending when Cecilia actually cuts Adrian's throat was just so effective and so shocking that I was really willing to accept most of the steps or all of the steps that it that it took for us to get there. Yeah, I, I guess my big issue with that was that Adrian is set up as being so smart and so in control and so manipulative and everything. It was clear to me that this dinner was not going to go well for him. And so it just made me think, why does he not understand that this dinner is not going to go well for him um but um i know john well he's have... he's not in the theater watching the movie so i think <laughs> that helps uh he's... and i i uh, with those those scenes actually uh with the the knife scenes uh, i guess we're we're not worrying about spoilers here uh you know where someone gets slashed and then the knife quickly gets into the hands of somebody i i, I you know how did i i can't even remember in that last scene how is it that Nadrian was holding the knife, okay? And was she just hoping that he would be holding this big knife when she came back into the room? Or was she standing there waiting for him to pick up the knife so that she could, you know what I'm saying? It just, it's, it's convenient. It's just like, you know, the fact that, I mean, you have that wonderful, uh, take, uh, Anthony mentions where, you know, you pull the hood off of the, uh, off of the intruder after you've killed him and it, it turns out it's a brother and not Adrian, uh, even though that might be a little bit, uh, you know, convenient and and so uh, but i don't know i mean i think when you dealing with heavy pl heavily plotted movies you sort of have to i don't know I, I you have to what you have to have some implausibilities i guess or uh they got to that last scene there at the dinner and i and i'm thinking well is there another way that you could have done this so that it wouldn't be so convenient you know uh but uh still i, I really uh did appreciate also appreciated that we didn't have a long extended scene of Adrian and and uh Cecilia uh, fighting in his uh yes. his his house okay yeah. mm -hmm. uh, people being thrown against walls and being uh, hanging off of uh, the cliff's edge falling into the pacific and instead it would just it was over like that and i thought yeah. that was really effective yeah right well, I, I did like in that scene although i i still i know i kept thinking how did they get the knife into their hands i guess surprise the element of surprise right but um, so one thing I liked about that last scene, right, was that the way she kills Adrian mirrors, of course, when Adrian kills her sister, sister. right? Mm -hmm. And I, I get, you get the impression, especially in the last third, right, that she's, she's becoming him, right? I mean, by the end, she's a slick liar too. She uses the suit. It seems to be sort of tainting her mind the same way it's tainted his, right? She sort of bullies her friend into the cop, into agreeing about the story about how Adrian died. And, you know, she walks off like a Hitchcock blonde at the end. And uh, it, it just seems to me like we, we, we need to be a little suspicious of what's happening to her too, right? It's also kind of sequel in a suit, I fear. <laughs> Yeah, I think there's not a sequel. I mean, I kind of want because I, so I was under the impression that there was this whole dark universe thing. Um, if, if I can explain this without taking too much time, but but basically, um, Universal has all these old monsters that they made tons of movies about back in say the 30s, uh, Dracula, Frankenstein's monster, the Invisible Man, Wolfman, yeah. the Mummy, and and their dream has been to make a, a Marvel Cinematic Universe style uh, series of movies with all these characters that all interlock and, and everything. And it keeps not working out because they, they release one movie and then it does really badly. And that kind of, you know, nixes the plan for the next 29. Um, but yeah, so I, I thought once I read that, I thought that there, that this was setting up a wider universe and that she was going to turn into some sort of villain or at least ambiguously 
you know moral kind of character but but then the the uh, the director and producer and stuff all said that there's no necessarily plans to connect this to any other movies or do a sequel or anything uh um, i hope i hope there isn't i'm 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 a big fan of standalone movies it seems to me that mm -hmm. when you make sequels it, it always reduces by one half the the reality of the pre the the original uh, uh so but wait, so, you're not you know, including Abbott and Costello meet the Invisible Man. <laughs> <laughs> really? Uh, at any rate, uh, you know, I, w I would. I mean, it's possible they would do that, but I don't. I don't think it's likely to be a, a good movie <laughs> yeah. if they make no. a sequel. I, I think from what I've read, I don't think they intend to, although it's left open, right? But I think what's right. more mm -hmm. important simply is that by the end, she seems to be kind of following in his footsteps, right? That she right. too seems to be headed to me down some road which was maybe a little darker than right and she's a she's a woman with issues and a slaughtered <laughs> uh, uh sister who has an invisibility suit exactly. <laughs> so uh yeah that i kind of like that with a foreboding i don't want to really yeah. know what she does with the suit i think that oh you know, i don't there'll either. be some interesting things that'll happen but i don't need right. to know them i can imagine but i also feel like what i like about the ending is it's open enough that you can still get that you know there's sort of it ends with this shot of her, her her face and it's kind of still and then there's this ominous music and then she smiles a little yeah. bit and i think you're allowed to both recognize this sort of darkness and ambiguity but also be like hell yeah like this guy tormented you for two hours and you finally got the jump on him and you're allowed to also feel this kind of release and satisfaction and you're you can kind of you know kind of move between the two different emotions one of the things that that ending does is set i mean it sort of alludes to the i think the thing about personal invisibility that is the most seductive uh element is the is the things you can do the powers that it gives you and pretty much all of these movies that deal with uh invisibility like this uh you know deal with that and uh, quite often the person who becomes invisible becomes a uh, uh, megalomaniac uh, uh almost actually tiresomely predictable <laughs> that they they do that but but uh you know you can see how it w it would appeal to your your antisocial instincts your your uh, um you know voyeuristic instincts i mean that the, the the other movies that have done uh uh invisibility have have explored some of this stuff uh, how how uh uh, you know, the, the feeling of power you could get from being able to, to, uh, be anywhere, see anything, go, go anywhere. Yeah. Well, well so Lisa, you were saying over email, uh, earlier yeah. that this goes all the way back to Plato. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. I was really, as I was poking around, I was really sort of, as I wanted to map out sort of that history of stories about invisibility. And I was surprised to see that, it, yeah, in, in the sort of what you're a Western tradition, it goes right all the way back to Plato's Republic. Um, and there's a story about the ring of uh, Yi Yi's and it's a shepherd finds a ring and it allows him to become invisible. And he, he was a previously virtuous man and he uses it to uh, murder his king and take the king's place and marry the queen and, and ends up just it never gets in trouble for it, which is kind of interesting. But um, but I, I know it's used in the Republic as a sort of story, right, a, 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 like a science fiction story, a what if, um, like a, wh how, how virtuous could you stay if no one could see you and you could do whatever you want? Would you remain a virtuous person? And yeah, I agree with what John's saying. It seems like every iteration of The Invisible Man practically is, is very much about that. Well, yeah, well, I wanted to bring up the... Um... The so there, there's like the classic Invisible Man movie from 1933, directed by James Whale, which is 100% on Rotten Tomatoes, uh, which is not a common feature of subsequent Invisible Man uh, movies. Yeah. Um, and this is fairly from from what I remember. I read the book a really long time ago, but uh, and I just watched this movie yesterday. But it's from what I remember, it's fairly uh, faithful to the um, to the book, um, and is considered a real classic. Um, I don't know. Is it, do, do any of you know? I I know a little bit more about. Actually, there's one thing that's really sort of interesting about the script of that movie because it is based on Wells's book, and in some ways, it does follow a lot of the the uh, circumstances that, of Wells's story. But uh, it's also uh, Universal had bought the rights to to the Invisible Man, Wells's book, but it also bought the rights to a book called The Murderer Invisible by Philip Wiley, yeah. which came out in uh, uh, 1931, a couple of years before the movie. And, and, and Wiley worked on the screenplay of The Invisible Man. He's uncredited. 
uh, as having worked on the screenplay. Actually, one of the other people who worked on that screenplay was Preston Sturges, which is really weird. The com- oh, right. comedy oh, director, uh, also funny. also uncredited. But um, at any rate, uh, so uh, if you if you if you've seen the uh, thirty three version in Wells's book, the uh, Griffin, the uh, experimenter who becomes invisible. Uh, he he has a, definitely uh, this impulse to uh, want to uh, uh, terrorize the world and and have power, and he's going to do that through uh, people who cross him. He will murder, but um, in the book, I think he kills maybe one person in in the book. In the movie, he kills hundreds. Uh, he like I think causes a train to derail and all yeah, these other yeah. things, and mm-hmm. and that's that's out of Wiley's book. Where his invisible man has this kind of reign of terror where he goes around, uh, killing people indiscriminately. Uh, so, so it's interesting how the, the thing, what became larger in, uh, even in that, that first, uh, rather faithful adaptation, uh, you know, the idea of the invisible man being really crazy. You know, the other thing is that, um, in the movie, the 33 movie, the, it's, it's, said that the chemical that he uses has a drug in it that uh, affects the mind and that that's uh, uh, alluded to being the explanation of why he, he goes crazy. Uh, whereas in Wells's book, there's nothing like that. It's just basically the power he has that that uh, enable, that causes him to to lose his, his moral uh, uh, framework. And, and I, I like that better, actually. You don't need to have some, some uh, crazy drug that's making you crazy. Uh, you have a, a just the opportunity that to become become a bad and you and you use it. Yeah. I mean, I, I re- what I really liked in this movie was that the police and the, you know, the, the people generally just know that there's an invisible man and they develop tactics throughout the movie to, to try to catch the invisible man in kind of a clever way. You know, they're all the police are all linking their arms and converging on the on his safe house and stuff like that. And um, the thing I remembered from the book, really, the only detail that really sticks out in my mind is how they were spreading broken glass on the roads, hoping that he would cut his naked feet on them. Um, and, and so there, there's all sorts of stuff like that that are, are sort of proposed in this uh, movie that I thought was because I, I think that that's what's most interesting to me about a lot of these movies is just like thinking through like, wait, how would invisibility actually work? And, you know, mm-hmm. what would be mm-hmm. the the more sort of concrete details? Right. And when they track him down in the 33 movie, uh, it's at winter and there's snow on the ground so they can see his footprints. They deliberately leave the snow field uh, unmarred so that they can see him as he moves. One of the other things that's interesting to me about the the original book, uh, Wells's book, is it was 1897 when it came out, uh, was that Griffin uh, was uh, an albino uh, before he, he made himself invisible. And in fact, that that was essential to him becoming invisible because he had no pigment in his eyes or in his, his hair. And so basically he was already a freak. Uh, uh, to the world of that time, and I mean that people tr- treated him badly, and and were he was alienated already before he he uh, 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 went into uh, became invisible. So I, I I think there's something Wells is saying there. I mean the uh, Griffin in the uh, the book is really a, in some ways a pathetic character as well as a dangerous one, and uh, you know he's not someone who's ever really been understood and and uh, embraced by the world uh so again uh his desire to have power over it and get revenge against it i think is uh, m- more explicable under those circumstances yeah so that's the 33 movie and then the other two movies i really wanted to bring up are memoirs of an invisible man from 1992 and hollow man from 2000 not technically the invisible man but sort of very similar premise um see anthony you were saying that you saw these a long time ago, so your memories are a little right. vague. What, what, <laughs> yeah. what do you, does anything stick out at all from these these movies? Um, I think that uh, from Memoirs of an Invisible Man, this was uh, you know right when I guess sort of towards the tail end of when Chevy Chase was this huge comedy star, and so I remember essentially just being thinking it was going to be a very funny movie and as i recall it really is i mean i I think there maybe is some comedy but it's much more a sort of straightforward adventure slash shading into horror movie um i also have this memory of that like he puts on like teeth whitener Hmm. and makeup like and so like just that he has this very artificially brightened skin 
and and teeth and that's really the only image i, I remember from it um and then from hollow man i mostly remember the scene where uh is it Ke it's kevin bacon yep. is that right that's right yeah kevin bacon disappears and he disappears sort of through if i recall like different parts of it, like different layers of his body kind of disappear over time. And so you get to like, see like all of his internal organs and everything. Um, and, and I remember also, well, let me just say, that that's, there's this... that's really oh, cool. The, the, the special effects in hollow man are actually really, really well done. And so they have this, yeah, invisibility and not anti-invisibility serum that they give people and animals. And so it affects the circulatory system first. And then it kind of like gets into the brain and gets into the muscles and fills out the skeleton. It all happens sort of, in the order that things would be flowing, you know, would be carried to different parts of the body through the bloodstream. And that's actually really, really cool. So yeah, I'm not surprised that that's something that sticks out in your mm -hmm. memory. Well, and I mean, it seems like those three movies, all the original, or the 1933 Invisible Man and Memoirs and Hollow Man, all of them to an extent exist as these special effects showcases. And, it, and it's really about like, how can we use in I guess in in the 30s, you know, both like visual effects and and practical effects to to create the illusion of somebody being there. And and I remember that film really being consisting to a large extent of these different set pieces to show different ways of um, showing off invisibility as an effect. And similarly, the 90s films, it seems like that was you know the early days of CGI, and so it was a way of hey, like here's a completely new way we can visualize invisibility. And and so um, I don't necessarily remember at least the, the memoirs or hollow man being a particularly good film and, and feeling much more like, you know, just, just a showcase for special effects. Yeah, and they're, they're 23% and 27% on Rotten Tomatoes respectively. So we're not talking about critical hits. Um, Lisa, do you, uh, <laughs> do you have, did you see these two memoirs and um, I, I haven't seen memoirs, but I saw hollow man a long time ago. And so I, you know, um, it's interesting because in some ways, right, it's very much in dialogue with the current Invisible Man because it's also sort of playing around with issues of of not just power, but gendered power, right? Mm -hmm. Because a lot yeah. of what he does is, um, well, he, he he goes after women while he's invisible. And I think he, he ends up, he doesn't he rape? He rapes a woman. Rapes a, he rapes a he woman. Rapes at least yeah. one yeah. woman there. Right, you're right. Yeah. Um, and that's interesting. I don't know if you guys know uh, the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, but in the comic book, the guy who plays Invisible Man, he also his loop starts with him um, using his invisibility to rape a bunch of schoolgirls. So, um, so, and that's from about that same time around 2000. So clearly, people by 2000 are playing with that gender thing, which is sort of interesting. And just that and the special effects—that's all I remember about it too. Yeah, the cool special effects. I don't. I don't think I saw the Chevy Chase movie, but I saw Hollow Man, and again, it was a long time ago. And I, one thing I remember uh, that it did, I thought, was interesting, and it was it was pretty hard to watch some parts of it, but uh, uh, was that it at the beginning, Kevin Bacon is is a sympathetic character, and uh, even after he's invisible, uh, you still, as he does things, you you are. What you're sympathizing with him, you kind of want him to, you know, he's stuck being invisible. They 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 can't get him back to being visible. They're you're hoping that he will be, uh, you know, and 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 then, uh, but he keeps doing more and more uh, questionable things, and then downright evil things. And what's kind of cool about that is that you, it sort of tricks the audience, okay, so that you get you. How far will you go with him? Before you say, oh wait a minute, uh, you know, all this stuff that seemed like harmless fun now is is uh you know uh evil and and so uh it sort of sucks the audience into uh the power fantasy okay of of being invisible until then you say well wait a minute no i wouldn't do that or gosh this is horrible i don't want to you know, so i i kind of like that al element of the movie although i don't think it you know really invested in that as much as it might have it became a a real uh violent film as i recall lots of people get killed by the end but of the movie but um, that's a Paul Verhoeven movie, right? I think yeah. I, I mm -hmm. seem to remember reading an interview with him that he actually did that on purpose because he wanted right. to see how far the audience would go with the character. And he said it was disturbing. Most people go a lot further than you would hope. <laughs> right. Uh, actually, that that is a uh, Verhoeven. I mean, you think about Starship Troopers where he flipped yeah. Heinlein's yes. book around upside down and, mm -hmm. and, yeah. and uh, you know, undermined so that you're cheering for these soldiers who actually are you know, part of a fascist government. So I think that that's probably something he did intend to do. Yeah. 
Yeah, I was really, I saw Hollow Man in the theater when it came out, and I was pretty crushingly disappointed. I mean, watching it now, it's actually, I think, a fairly effective thriller for most of it. My big disappointment at the time was that I thought it was going to be more like the Wells novel where he was going to be out in the world doing cool stuff. And pretty much the whole um, story is is confined to this lab so that it, it basically turns into like Alien for the last third of the movie. Um, but um, Kevin Bacon's good in it. I mean, there's a lot of um, like sexual harassment and sexual violence like that I think yes. is not going to play well <laughs> yeah. with a contemporary yeah. Yeah. audience. Um, so it's hard to recommend the movie, but really, it really, it's just sort of the special, I, I, I really, the special effects is really the main selling point to me. And I think that Kevin Bacon's arc is interesting, but I think it's way too, happens way too fast for, you know, like shoving it into a feature film makes him get way too evil, way too quickly. It, you know, if this were over like a season of TV or something, um, mm -hmm. I think it might work a lot better. And one of the things about this new movie that I liked, uh, which is not really a special effect, but. Uh, the way that the director used the the camera setups uh, of various scenes where the camera's static and, uh, you know, Elizabeth Moss is uh, doing something in one part of the screen and then your but your eye is always going off to some corner of the screen. There's nothing, you know, what I, what I mean is you're imagining the invisible man there in the background or something or, or, you know, when she's being interrogated in the police by the police. You know, the camera switches to a corner of the room and it's just a bare corner of the room. There's nothing there. But, uh, you know, you get this very creepy feeling. So pretty soon you're, you're imagining that the invisible man is everywhere, uh, even though you don't know and he probably isn't in a lot of these scenes, but, but you're imagining mm -hmm. that he is because just the way the, the scenes are framed. I listened to an interview with the director and he was saying that it was really sort of an odd experience shooting this movie because so many times he would say action and then everyone's just standing there. They're filming an empty hallway or something and nobody's sure <laughs> yeah. when the scene's going to stop. And then, you know, after some number of minutes, he says cut, you know, and everyone's just, it's just kind of like, it's just a weird, it's like weird to be filming nothing happening uh, in a movie, you know. I mean, one other way that I, the, the new Invisible Man kind of breaks from these previous films is we were talking about... I don't know if Memoirs of the Invisible Man really falls into this, but that sort of paradigm of an Invisible Man story where it's usually a scientist and they get in, gain invisibility and that's – there's sort of this arc of uh, this descent. That that's the thing that kind of makes them turn into a megalomaniac and, and that's the that's really their downfall. And it's, I like the fact that in the new one, you know, he's really a monster from the beginning and, and it's not clear that the invisibility changes anything about him. It just is a weapon that he uses. And so that if anyone is, is changed by the invisibility, it's the Elizabeth Moss character rather than him. Right. Yeah, well, actually, I'll say Memoirs of an Invisible Man is a wholly sympathetic, you know, the Invisible Man is a wholly sympathetic character in that movie. There's actually an interesting story. I'll try to get go through it really quickly, but the uh, it's based on a novel by H.F. Saint from 1987. And he was a Wall Street guy and he wanted, you know, he'd always wanted to be a writer, but, you know, he just sold one story to Esquire when he was in grad school and then hadn't written anything else. And, you know, he wrote this novel explicitly to be a commercial success. And, um, you know, it, it got a low advance, you know, it was a $5,000 advance, but then um, almost immediately the film rights sold for millions of dollars. And he actually made so much money off of it that he never wrote anything again because he just retired. <laughs> nice. Um, and then Chevy Chase, you know, at this time was a huge comedy star, but he wanted to transition into serious dramatic roles. And he read the book and thought this what might be a good vehicle for him to do it. So he kind of like pushed it as basically a vanity project for himself. And they got a bunch of screenwriters, I think, including William Goldman to write a screenplay. And they all just thought, you know, Chevy Chase is an invisible man. This is a comedy. Come on. And so they wrote it as a comedy. And he's like, no, this the whole point of this is that I want this to be my serious dramatic thing. And so he was pushing them to make it more of a thriller. So it comes out being this really weird middle grounds where it's not funny, but it's not <laughs> intense. It's not thrilling either. Um, and so it's as a film, it's pretty unwatchable. But the um, the the premise is great. The premise is that there's this a Wall Street guy and he goes to this um, science lab and something goes wrong and they evacuate the building, but he's still inside. And so sections of the building get turned invisible. And so he gets turned invisible along with it. And uh, so he has actually a suit of clothes, you know, the clothes that he was wearing that time get turned invisible. So he doesn't have to run around naked all the time. He has an actual set of invisible clothes and invisible shoes and stuff. So I think that's a great premise. And it, it, it deals with a lot of interesting, like, what's it like, what's it like to be invisible? But then the the second half of the movie, you can pretty much stop watching in the second half of the movie. It gets really, really bad. 
Um, but I've heard the book is great. You know, my parents read the book when it came out and some of their friends, and I remember them all loving it. Um, actually, it has some cool details, too. Like, there's this, these government agents uh, who are trying to capture him, and they show up at his apartment, and they have these kind of spray paint guns where they're sort of spraying paint all around the room to, you know, to try to, you know, catch him. Right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's, there's some there's some cool stuff in it. But I kept thinking... Uh, uh... And if I were Elizabeth Moss in this movie, recent movie, I'd just go down to the hardware store and buy some spray paint, right? And, you know, <laughs> I'd have that in my purse all the time. And uh, But, you know, that's probably too simple. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, in Hollow Man, too, they have, um, you know, thermal thermal imaging goggles, which pretty much negates the advantage of being invisible if you have those. And so there is this sort of modern technology, you know, kind of cancels out some of the benefits of invisibility if, if you have it. Um, I guess, I mean, it is one thing I wanted to bring up is this, this issue of, um, what do we think about having your body actually turn invisible, like in the invisible man versus having an invisibility suit, like in this new movie or like in a uh, predator or ghost in the shell or, or something like that. So, uh, I don't know, Lisa, what do you think about that? Do you prefer? Well, I mean, the invisibility suit is is more plausible immediately, right? I mean, you don't have to worry about like, well, if his eyes are invisible, how can he see anything, right? Because how are photons hitting and bouncing off his eye? Aren't they just going through? Um, but I, I but I kind of like the magic of of being able to turn invisible through these sort of chemical or other kind of means, um, because just because you can't undo it, right? You put the suit on, you can take the suit off, and there's something. That's why Aiden has to be set up as being kind of insane beforehand, right? Because it's not like, what's interesting to me about the other invisible men is they become invisible and they can't become visible, right? And that's part of what drives them insane. And that's sort of interesting. I think there's more dramatic potential in that. Right. I mean, the irreversibility, uh, you know, makes it a stigma as well as a, a source of power. So, right. uh, uh, you know, that that complicates it, whereas uh, the suit putting on and off, um, you know, makes it optional. <laughs> right. You can right. accessorize. Think, yeah. It's like a, on tvtropes.com, there's a trope called cursed with awesome, right? And that's what it is. You're cursed with awesomeness, right? Or blessed with suckiness, depending on the story. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but I think that that's just more interesting to me. Like what, what would you have to grapple with if you're invisible? See, Anthony, what do you think? Suit verse. No, I agree that, that the suit, is less like a meta, it feels less like metaphorically potent. It's just then it becomes more a device for other kinds of storytelling versus invisibility when you yourself become invisible is, uh, yeah, I mean, it just, it sort of obviously has much more kind of this personal, um, it, it, you know, it, it, it feels like it has this sort of metaphorical richness that, that the other doesn't, but it then is, it feels magical too. Is that it, it feels like you basically moved into the realm, at least, if you were to make something now in, in 2020, it would feel like much more that you've moved into the realm of, of fantasy rather than science fiction. We haven't uh, mentioned one of the great Invisible Man novels, Invisible Man by uh, Ralph Ellison, <laughs> okay, yes. where where yes. it's about a, a black man who is not literally invisible. And there, there it is, a metaphor, a metaphorical uh, vision of invisibility. I mean, it's clearly Ellison knew Wells' book. It's actually very interesting to me, actually, because Wells is – Invisible Man is an albino. He's white. He's as white as you get. He's a really white man, okay, who literally becomes invisible. And then Ralph Ellison is a black man who doesn't literally become invisible, but he he's seen through. People look through him. They don't see him. He you know he can he, he's not uh, he can't impinge on the social uh, universe uh, of white people. So uh, I, you know I, I, I the the, the what the mirror image thing going on there is really cool, and the way that Allison uses it as a as a metaphor through the book is really uh yeah. really wonderful it's cool and and yeah i I love that, and especially because even though it's meta a metaphoric invisibility, um the invisible man in Ellison's book goes through the same trajectory and becomes an invisible jerk ass, just like a lot of his <laughs> other characters do. That's another T V trope thing. Um but it's really true, right? Like he's he tries to do the right stuff and then eventually he's like, eh, maybe I don't have to. I'm gonna be like this pimp. I'm gonna do this and this and he ends up starting a riot. Like it just does not go well, right? Um and it's not until he sort of confronts that invisibility and goes underground and builds himself his time machine that he can get away from the rest of that. I mean, that kind of makes me think of 
a type of Invisible Man story where the Invisible Man is not physically invisible, but somehow people can't perceive him. And so yeah. uh, there was, I can't remember what the story was, but there was one where somebody wished to be basically, people would just forget him as soon as the, he, he was so average looking to to such a supernatural degree that people would just instantly forget him as soon as they saw him. And so he could like walk in and rob a bank and everyone would just be like, I didn't even notice. Was there somebody here? Um, it also kind of makes me think in, it's, it's funny, you know, in the, um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, there's the bug batter beast of Tra, which is so stupid that it thinks that if you can't see it, it can't see you either. So right. if you meet one, you have to wrap a towel around your head so you can't see it. And then it thinks that it can't see you either. Right. <laughs> so. There was a, a sequence in, was it an Amazon women on the moon that yes. silly where, uh, yes. uh, the character is it's, it's redoing the scene from the invisible man, uh, the 1933 version where he takes off his uh, bandages over his head and his clothes and he gets naked and then he's invisible. Well, it's played the same way, except when he takes off the bandage, he's not invisible at all. He thinks he's invisible, but he's running around the room naked, picking up chairs and throwing them and, you know, <laughs> acting as if somehow they can't see him. It's really absurd. <laughs> Wait, what, what is that Amazon women? Is that something I, I should watch? Uh, it's a, You've it's never a, seen it? Oh I've never, I don't think I've ever I heard of it. I have not seen it either. It's oh, a, shit. it's a, uh, anthology. It's a bunch of skits. Okay. Uh, uh, it was made in the early eighties, late seventies. Yeah. Uh, it's a. Uh, um, so I think some of the um, maybe uh, Saturday Night Live people were involved in making the movie. Uh, maybe was John Landis the director of that movie? Could be. Ugh, I can't remember. Yeah, yeah, but it's a it's a bunch of not, uh, little skits that are all yeah. sort of tied together or not tied together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, hmm. like um, we were talking about virtual invisibility or social invisibility, and there's been a number of science fiction novels I know that have done that and. I mean, one that I really like is um, uh, Cory Doctorow's Down and Out in the Magic Kingdom, when there's a character there who uh, kills his best friend. And in theory, in this world, it doesn't matter because everyone uploads their memories so you can, you know, reload into a clone body and it's an inconvenience. But it's also still socially inappropriate to kill your best friend. And so when he does that, the character loses all of his social credibility. It's a whole world that's based, it's like an Amazon marketplace. Everything you do is ranked in this sort of global ranking system. And he loses all of his uh, woofy for killing his friend, and then he becomes virtually invisible. So um, he, they still have to feed him and house him because it's a post-scarcity society, but like no one will talk to him, and elevators won't recognize him, and vending machines won't give him food. Like Even the machines won't see him at that point. And it's really terrifying, actually. That kind of reminds me of that Black Mirror episode where you can block people yes. in real life, and they're kind of yes. all like, staticky. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Has anyone um, followed what sort of response this movie? I didn't have time to read any reviews or articles or anything. Anthony, did you uh, did you see any? The reviews have been very positive overall. I don't know like what the current Rotten Tomato score was, but but um, uh, you know, a few days ago it was pretty. You know, it was it was mixed. It wasn't you know universal acclaim, but but in general, people seem to like it. Uh, Manola Jargis, the New York Times, gave it a critics' pick, which is pretty unusual for the Times to do that to a you know genre horror film. And and it seems like people are mostly embracing it. I don't know how well it did this weekend, though. I when I saw it, I looked up the Rotten Tomato score. This is only a couple of days after it came out, and it was uh, ninety percent critics and ninety percent viewers as well. Um, at that point, I don't know where it is yeah. now. Well, I saw it last night, and I went to a four or five o'clock show, and it was sold out. And then when I left, all the shows through eleven p.m. were sold out too. So. You know, obviously people are going to see it. And I don't know where you all live and what theater audiences are like, but they are rowdy in Atlanta. And I got to say, like I said, <laughs> people were into that movie. Like everyone was just there for it, you know, willing to be scared at the scary parts, cheering on Elizabeth Moss at the fights. It was it was exciting. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a, a crowd pleasing movie. I mean, I always go like, you know, Monday morning first thing. And then, mm-hmm. you know, as people if anyone sits near me, I move to the least occupied part of the movie. <laughs> right. And I have to be careful not so, like, if anyone takes out their phone before the movie, so, I just assume they're going to take it out at some point during the movie, so I try to move so I can't see so, them. David, you're telling us you try to be invisible? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I try, to, I try to make everyone else. I need that black mirror blocking technology <laughs> when I go to movies, for sure. Um, I'm just looking at my notes here. I guess, like... One thing that's another thing that's kind of interesting about Memoirs of an Invisible Man is there's a part where, you know, in all these other things, it's uh, being invisible is this superpower and like the character in the 
33 movie goes on and on about how he can rule the world, like nobody can stop him and stuff. And the the Chevy Chase character, you know, he's invisible and he's on the run from the government. And he's really sort of, um, you know, he feels helpless because every time he eats, it makes him visible <laughs> for a while as the food digests. And so he's there's just a scene where he's kind of walking down the street and he's just starving and he can't eat anything um, or it's going to give his position away. And he just thinks like, oh, man, being invisible sucks. You know, it's all it's not what it's uh, cracked up to be. Yeah, actually, the the assumption that uh, those like the thirty three movie makes that an invisible man would have this great power always seemed a little bit weird to me. You know, I can see maybe walking to the bank and walking out with some money, but I, you know, it doesn't seem to me that you would have the ability to tell other people what to do without, uh, you know, without them just ignoring you. I guess. Uh, yeah, that's what I sort of liked when I went back and looked at the the book. Um, is is that Griffin's pretty desperate, you know, because he he burns down his house right, and then he leaves, and he doesn't have anything with him, and he doesn't have any money, and it's like he's kind of he doesn't have any of his equipment. He has to try to rebuild his science from scratch, and then he's got to get money, and this is sort of what causes all the trouble, right? That he can't work, so he's got to try to steal the money, but he's kind of bad at it, and and. It, and once again, everyone knows something weird is happening in the village, right? So. Right, right. And in the end of the, the book, he gets beaten to death, death yeah, by yeah. a mob, okay? Yeah. I mean, and, 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 you know, he becomes visible on the last page and it's, right. you know, it's pathetic, really. It's, uh, mm -hmm. you know, his his uh, idea that he would control the world and uh, really was a delusion. It wasn't yeah. really based on, on uh, I mean, he had certain powers, but... But it wasn't going to work out the way he imagined it would. Well, that also makes me think of the, um, especially thinking about invisibility in the context of gender, is the the Fantastic Four, mm -hmm. where you know the one uh, female member of the Fantastic Four is the invisible. Uh, I think she goes by the Invisible Girl, and is Sue Storm, and that like there's something very gendered about the fact that everyone else has a, a far more aggressive. Mm -hmm fighting power and then she has invisibility which is obviously more associated with with stealth and then even so i think they they kind of ran up this ran up against this issue where there there wasn't that much she could do and so i remember there's an early issue of the fantastic four where they're answering their fan mail and somebody is complaining that sue is not doing enough and eventually they have to give her this other power which involves like this creating this force field to protect the team because invisibility when you're fighting, you know, giant alien monsters that are destroying New York City is just not that useful. But even then, that second power is still a sort of nurturing power. Right. It's so, still gendered. So she, it's still yeah, very gendered. So, you know, she's she's a woman. She's invisible. She has no power. Right. <laughs> and doesn't that there's an invisible girl in the um in the Incredibles too? the teenage daughter is invisible as well. Mm -hmm. Women in comics tend to be invisible or small. <laughs> That's often their right. powers. Yeah, well, you know, welcome to the 1960s when most of those characters were created. But, yeah, it's amazing how many of them that, that – I mean, not – I don't know if there's like dozens, but a number of them. Very small, very invisible. See, does anyone – so I mentioned that um, this 33 movie is 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. And then you have this new movie, which is, yeah, like 92% on Rotten Tomatoes. And then between that, there's like a – how many year, like 80 or 90 year, 90 year gap of movies, of Invisible Man movies that I think are not that well regarded. Does anyone have any thoughts about why there's so many bad Invisible Man movies or why it's been so hard to come up with another good one all this time? Well, I was looking at all the iterations and I noticed that there was, I think it was a couple TV series where... It's like the guy is turned invisible because a government experiment goes wrong, but then becomes a government agent. And I'm like, why would you work for the government that did that to you? Maybe it was implausible. Maybe that's why no one wanted to watch these. It didn't sound exciting to me, I have to say. That's my theory. Silly. I mean, there's also something about the dramatic difficulty of, of making something compelling when the, you know, the star or the protagonist, you can't see them for most of the, the story. Yeah. Right, and also invisibility is it's kind of a sneaky power, okay? It doesn't in a, it, it in a way it doesn't lend itself I think to a lot of different storylines. Uh um uh, you know, it has a limited uh uh range of uh, uh of a potential of, of plots, I think. 
uh, or at least that's what we've seen in the movies. They don't, they don't really, they seem to come up with new things. I mean, think of Hollow Man is, is really is like the 1933 version. And then, you know, we have this current one. We have these, uh, uh, out of control, invisible men. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, I don't know. Maybe there's a, is there a reason for that? I, I don't know. It, you know, in the movie, uh, Forbidden Planet, which was one of my favorite movies as a kid, it has an invisible monster. And it made me think about how at least if so, if something is destructive or, or dangerous or threatening to you, to make it invisible does raise the bar for that, okay? But that seems to be the whole thing right there, okay, is, is uh, you know, making the threat more threatening. Uh, uh, but... You know, or making the uh, you know the temptation to to violate others more uh, tempting, but uh, I don't know what other things uh, you can do. I've never written an Invisible Man story. <laughs> well, it, it's funny this issue of you know film being an inherently visual medium, and then invisibility. How does it deal with that? I mean, even just in the poster for Memoirs of an Invisible Man, they have to show like they obviously have to show that Chevy Chase is in the movie, but then they also have to show that he's invisible. And so it's kind of weird. He's sort of like the Invisible Man, and then you can kind of Chevy Chase's face is sort of vaguely painted, floating in the air, and it's just like sort of gets at that problem of trying to indicate the of those sort of two competing tensions. And I actually, I, you know, I wrote a, a science fiction story years ago that was published called They Go Bump, and it's about a group of soldiers, and they all have invisibility suits, and they're um, you know they're sort of walking across the surface of this moon, and they can't see each other obviously because they're all invisible. And the main character starts to um, get paranoid that his friends are all being replaced by aliens who are then mimicking their voices. And um, I had a lot of people like contact me saying they wanted to make it into a movie. <laughs> but then uh, they had, they never had quite figured out how you would do it. <laughs> you know, like, how do you show a movie where all the literally, literally all the characters are invisible for the whole story? Uh, there's a mm. problem there. Well, hopefully they'll make it someday. Yeah. If anyone listening has any good ideas about how to do it, yeah, let me know. Um, let's see what else. Like, oh, the other thing I was going to mention, uh, John, is when you were saying that uh, she should have gotten spray paint. The whole thing with the dog was making me think, you know, you should just have an attack dog because it seems like an attack dog would make short work of an invisible man. Right, because a, a, a dog would smell. Uh, smell is as important as vision for a dog. So, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, there should be police dogs there. So she should have taken the dog with her from <laughs> the very beginning of the movie is what I'm hearing. Yeah. Well, she didn't know. I mean, she didn't know at that point about the invisibility suit. That's true. That's true. Certainly, yeah, maybe at the – well, and then she was kind of being chased out of the house. But, but I was thinking, you know, when the SWAT team raids the house toward the end of the movie – I thought it would have been kind of cool if they had, yeah, like canines and infra, you know, infrared <laughs> goggles and stuff that they had actually like. Because now that yeah. we know that the invisibility suit is real, that they were, had sort of planned for it, you know. That's absolutely right. That makes perfect sense. It's, someone in tactic tactics uh, at the police department didn't think it through. So what did you all think of the actual suit? Did you like the suit design with like the little cameras going up and down at the end when you finally get a good look at it? What did you think about that? I liked it. I thought it was, I mean, it's one of those things that, again, not as, uh, unlike the character, I am not one of the world's foremost uh, experts in <laughs> optics, which they kept reminding us about. But, like, I I felt like it was one, I mean, again, a lot of this movie is kind of hand wavy. And the suit was one of those elements where they gave you just enough where you could sort of extrapolate a technology, but it didn't give you a detailed explanation. And I like that. And then I just liked also the weird mechanical sounds it would make those yeah. sort of these like weird like snapping like whirring sounds and that was really effective and i like the way the little cameras i guess those were cameras on it like we'd sort of move yeah. in and out it felt kind of disturbing like it was like this ripply service surface um I it was wrong in a in a good way i thought you know i thought it looked super cool and i i thought that the way that it you know having all the cameras and the sort of you know video screen surfaces and stuff. I think that is how a suit like that would actually work. You know, whenever I see um, like a special about it or something, uh, it's always like some something along those lines. I mean, I guess, I mean, I know that for this movie, it has to work this well, but I'm, I'm, I'm really skeptical that you could ever have something where, you know, somebody's sitting, right. you know, a, a yeah. three feet away and they, they think that you're there and they can't see you at all. 
Um, but, That's uh, why the uh, I thought the Predator movies did a good job because it was light bending, but it was you know you if you looked you yeah. could see that there was a a being there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's sort of what what I think was is a lot more plausible. I mean, John, you said that in in the Moon and the Other, how, how did you talk about how did you use the? I, I, I thought of it as a, a optical light bending, where you know the 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 light that comes from one side of the the person or whatever is in the suit uh, gets bent around the the suit to, and then projected on the other side, so as if as if the thing wasn't there. And uh, that's been around. That idea's been around a long time. I think Arthur Clarke wrote a essay about this like in the 60s that i read so and i think a lot of other people i mean predator certainly had something like that going in it i think that the idea has been around a long long time um because uh you know and, and it's much more plausible you i think you could actually do something like that or much more likely to be able to do something like that than to do the chemical reducing the uh index of refraction of a human being to the same as that of of air is not possible <laughs> okay so so that i think is uh uh and that's what wells talks about and he has a wonderful little discussion of you know indexes of refraction he uses analogies like saying putting a, a piece of a pane of glass in a in a tank of water it becomes almost invisible because the index of refraction of the water and the glass is almost the same so uh you know it has real optics in it but i i don't think that chemically altering the human body that way would leave you with something who was still alive well, in in Hollow Man, that they say something about that the your molecules are vibrating out of phase with the visible universe or something like that. So, you know, again, I, I think that's just pretty hand wavy, but I mean, it's it's at least you know, if it's something like at that level of physics, um, is maybe you know, like a little bit more persuasive than than some sort of chemical process or something. I don't know. You're, you've got a physics degree, don't you? I do have a physics degree. I, I, I think the uh, one of the things, uh, standard ways of explaining things in uh, uh, science fiction is uh, vibrations, atomic <laughs> vibrations. Okay, you know, you're going to change your vibrations, and then you're going to be able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. And I, you know, I think that's not very credible. So I think actually, you know, uh, doing it like a Magritte painting where, you know, Magritte did this paintings where there's a painting on an easel in front of a window and then there's a tree behind it and the tree is on the painting. And so you can, can't really see the canvas because, it, you know, the picture is reproducing what's behind it exactly. That's essentially what the kind of invisibility that might happen, although it would have to be done, you know, with with screens and technology or or, or fiber optics that, that are completely perfect and and wrap around a, a, an object. So, I don't know. Yeah, but I, I guess I would believe it more as sort of really good camouflage where if you know the direction of the person who's looking at you, yeah. it takes that mm -hmm. into account. You know, that seems a lot more plausible to me than, you know. Right, right. That's what, essentially what we're talking about here is is camouflage. You know, I suppose those, uh, you know, lizards that change their color to fit whatever thing they're next to uh yeah uh or or there are sea creatures that do this on the sea bottom so maybe it's not, maybe it's possible to do that well and i guess the other plausibility thing about so many of these stories is that i could imagine that eventually you could get to the 100% effective invisibility but we have to just accept that the suit that he like so for example the new invisible man was 100% effective mm -hmm. from the start versus buggy and, you know, you could see, you know, I mean, until yeah. until she started, you know, then there, it sustained some damage. So then you started to see the bugs. But for the first two thirds of the movie, it was, you know, a hun it was like the most, you know, impressive beta version of a suit that I've ever, technology <laughs> that I've ever seen. Was anyone and he had he had made more than one of them, too. I mean, there were at least yeah. two that were, you know, perfect. Was, was anyone uh, uh, bothered by the scene in the rainstorm where apparently the fact that it was in a rainstorm didn't really make him visible, and I thought it would make him much more visible than it did. You know, they had little bits of some drops of water on on him, but I I didn't think that I thought his figure would be would be visible in the in the rain. So well, because they made such a big deal out of it, they had yeah. the newscast saying the rain is coming, and you're like, okay, let's see the effect. Right. It's sort of like they they set it up for that, and then they didn't really use it. See, so Lisa, were you going to say something? No, isn't there a scene? I, I haven't seen the Chevy Chase movie, but isn't there? I thought that that movie was famous for doing a scene in the rain, wasn't? Yeah. Isn't there like a famous rain scene? Yeah, sort so, of. The, there's yeah. a romantic scene where where they're in the rain and and she can see him pretty. You know, he's sort of this beautiful, shimmery, you know, shape. Right, um, right. 
I mean, that's actually something that Hollow Man does really well. Is you see him mm-hmm. underwater, you see him splashed with blood, you see him like sprayed with a fire extinguisher. There's like all these things that sort of outline his uh, his form, and, and those mm-hmm. are all really well done. Yeah. All right, cool. So we're uh, yeah we're running a little short on time here. So I don't know if there's is there anything about any of these movies or books or subjects of invisibility that anyone wanted to bring up before we uh, start wrapping this up. Um, I wanted to mention really quickly that I think there's also a pretty fun treatment of it in an early episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer uh, in this first season called Out of Mind, Out of Sight. And in a lot of ways, I think it's probably the... I mean, like a lot of early Buffy, I think it's more interesting in concept than it is in execution. Um, But it's about this girl in high school who is so invisible, you know, that she's invisible to all her classmates. So eventually she becomes literally invisible. And there's this really, really effective scene where the way her social isolation is illustrated when they find her school yearbook and everyone has signed it, have a great summer. And that's literally the only signature they could, the only message they can find in any of any page of the yearbook. And I just remember that really sticking with me and really uh, frightening me. So I, I think like when we talk about that sort of just that metaphor of, of, you know, you're metaphorically figuratively invisible and then you become literally invisible. I think that's a really fun example of it. There's a, a book that was written in the 50s. It got made into a movie in the 60s. I think it's called The Power. And it's about – there's a person, uh, this villain in it who has a, a sort of a psychic ability to project into people around him, uh, into their minds. What happens is if, if if I look at this person, I see – I don't see him. I see – Something that I, uh, something I really uh, like, uh, the kind of person I really like. So, you know, if I'm a professor, I might see, you know, a bright and and uh, lively, intelligent student. Okay, and if I'm a, you know, a, a, a combat soldier, I would see, uh, you know, a, 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 a another combat soldier who's a, you know, a good uh, a fighter and my my compatriot. And and so it essentially makes him invisible to everyone because it, it, it they see him but they don't really see him they see what they want to see and and or something that that ingratiates him to them which was really a, i thought a fascinating idea i don't think i've ever seen that in any other other thing that kind of i don't know that kind of reminds me of the suits in um Philip K Dick's Scanner Darkly where it projects different it's like this con- constantly shifting collage of different types of people and features so to to mask your identity, so you know that there's somebody there, but you have no idea, right? Who it is, right? I forgot about that. Yeah, I think people talk about well, he's you know that vague blur, <laughs> or yeah. <laughs> I thought they did a good job of that in the uh, animated version of that that story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I like that a lot. Um, I guess I guess maybe the final thing I'll mention here is how do we feel about this idea that being invisible would turn people mad with power and make them do evil things i was thinking actually i mean it kind of makes me think of the internet you know where people Uh, you know sort of act like sociopaths on the internet because at least they feel i feel like the internet is more of the illusion of invisibility than the reality you know that people are always they feel like they're invisible and they're saying all this stuff and then they're like oh wait actually people figured out who i was and i wasn't as invisible as i thought i was but i don't know lisa what do you what do you think do you think that uh people would go mad with power it would corrupt anyone who's turned into Yeah, well, you know, it's an interesting question, right? I mean, because I, 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 I was thinking about it. I'm like, would I really do that? I mean, couldn't you use your power for good? I mean, that sounds so dorky, but um, I, I got to say overall, though, when I think about stories about it, people are pretty pessimistic. I, I don't know. I, it's, it's Would I use my power for good if I were invisible? I hope so, <laughs> but but maybe not. I'm thinking... Um, I don't know if you know, Amiri Baraka wrote a series of stories about two contemporary black guys who find a time machine and they can go back to the antebellum era and they're invisible when they're there. And you would think that, right, they would like set the other slaves free, like set their ancestors free. But all they do is like play pranks on everyone, like including the slaves, like they're just useless. And it's kind of funny, but I I sort of feel like maybe that would be what it was like if people could get invisibility. You would just use it for these really banal things. I'm not sure you would go mad with power. I think you'd go mad with like stupidity. Hmm. And it would all be like impractical jokers. Well, I also think you become you'd be alienated from everyone. I mean, as long as you were an yeah. invisible, you 
you know, you don't really connect with anyone. You're observing things. You can see things maybe and find out secrets and know whatever the people say about you and things like that, which seems like maybe you might want to know that, but maybe you wouldn't. All right. I, 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 yeah. You know, I think that that uh, in some ways, invisibility is kind of a inherently unpleasant uh, superpower. OK, I mean, unless you just want to be a peeping Tom or something like that. But but, uh, you know, I would think even that would get old pretty fast. So uh, We're assuming you're alone, <laughs> are we assuming you're alone in your invisibility? Oh, I mean, the, the other people who are are invisible. Because to, if there's other invisible people, uh, maybe it wouldn't uh, be so terrible. Uh, right. Uh, well, I suppose I hadn't thought about don't, that. Don't these people all go crazy because they're alone? I mean, that's well, I. It's a combination of loneliness and power. I think usually. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I I think it would be very disillusioning to to be able to spy on people and see things about them. You know, probably very few of us could could uh, you know stand to be observed all all the time uh, you know uh so uh and it's a it's a depressing concept there's actually there's a scene like that in memoirs of an invisible man where chevy chase is hanging around his friends and he, they don't know he's there because he's invisible and they're all talking about what an asshole he is and it's <laughs> exactly that <laughs> right experience. Yeah. um all right so yes we're uh we're all out of time here so maybe uh if anyone has any other final thoughts so uh anthony any final thoughts here about the Invisible Man or Invisibility? Uh, no no grand thoughts. I do think that the new version of The Invisible Man is very good, and people should see it. Yeah. How about Lisa? Any final thoughts? Um, yeah. You know, what's interesting is I was looking around, and just my last thought I put here is I cannot find any stories about invisibility by women. And I'm not really sure what that means, but The Invisible Man does seem to be a story that appeals to men for some reason. <laughs> and maybe I, you know, and I feel like there's a whole other conversation there, but I, I think that's interesting. And I, so if anyone can find some stories about invisibility by women, I'd, I'd love to know about them. I mean, besides all the news reports about the invisibility of aging women and stuff, but fictional treatments, I wonder if, if there's why they're not there, but it's, it's a fascinating question to me. And yeah, I just end by I, opening that question. <laughs> yeah, there's there's a um, there's a movie called The Invisible Woman. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't seen it, but I heard a pod. I listened to a podcast where people were talking about a bunch of those, mm -hmm. and they, it sounds like pretty awful. I mean, but they they mm -hmm. were saying that um, you know there's a, a apparently a part where one of the characters who's who's male says like, "How do I know that you're attractive?" And she says, "Well, here, let me put on a stocking so you can see how shapely my leg is." You know, is this the movie from the 1940s? Is that yeah. the 1940s one? Yeah, that yeah. one's weird. But again, I wouldn't, I mean, a woman didn't write it, right? No, no, so yeah. even if it's about a woman, it's just interesting to me that I, I, I no, haven't my, seen my, women. My point was, was to mention what happened yeah. in it to make it clear oh, that right. it was not written by a woman. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, how do you know? Women might like their own shapely lakes too. But, you <laughs> I know, so. I, see your, yeah. I see your point though. Yeah, it's interesting. So I don't know what to make of that, but it's a fascinating sort of uh, thing I just realized. Well, men, men are, um, men are, are voyeurs. At heart, that's what it is. Well, maybe, yeah. maybe. Well, men also maybe don't grapple with invisibility, uh, like I said, on the uh, same day-to-day -day level uh, that many women do. So, you know, maybe it's not amusing to write about it when it's your life. Yeah, but if there's any, if there are any good stories about invisibility written by women, definitely. I want to know. Yeah, know. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, cool. So, um, John, did you have any final thoughts? Oh, just uh, um, I want to give props to um, Elizabeth Moss, who is really quite – uh, good in this role. She plays, uh, someone said she's the Betty Davis of modern actresses and that she plays these, uh, very fraught women, women who are in terrible, terrible situations with tremendous conviction and, uh, uh, sympathy. So, uh, yeah, you should go see it for her alone. Yeah. Yeah. I, I thought the movie was, I've been thinking about it ever since I saw it. I was, was gripped through the whole thing. So yeah, definitely best invisible man movie. <laughs> you're likely to see uh, anytime soon. So, um, yeah, so I think that's a good note to end on. So we've been speaking with Anthony Ha, Lisa Yasek, and John Kessel. So thanks, everyone, so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. And that was our panel. So big thanks again to Anthony Ha, Lisa Yasek, and John Kessel for joining us on the show. And remember that Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoyed the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution, you can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. 
All right, so that was our show. So thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.